So welcome everyone in this Budapest lecture evening uh, that happens to be on the first Monday in October, which is not an average Monday in October. It's not an everyday Monday uh, in October. It's not a usual Monday in October. And this evening, uh, we are going to find out why this is the case with our distinguished expert, um, we have the huge privilege of welcoming Ilya Shapiro from the New York-based Manhattan Institute. Ilya is a US constitutional scholar and expert in constitutional law and had been with Cato Institute as vice president and as the director of the Cato Center for Constitutional Studies for almost 15 years. And he was also publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review. He was then the executive director and senior lecturer at the Georgetown Center for Constitution. And he is the author of the superb book, Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nomination and the Politics of America's Highest Court. And we are going to explore today this area of the law. And as I mentioned, the first Monday in October had quite a significance overseas. Some of us may well remember the very charming movie from the 1980s uh, with uh, Walter Matthau with the same title. But the first Monday in October also symbolizes... I know, a lot of these folks weren't even born in the 1980s. But so, some of... Some of <laughs> I, I saw some of them, yeah. <laughs> but it also symbolizes, and it's more, more important uh, today, it also symbolizes uh, the, the official beginning of the new term of the Supreme Court of the United States. And we have fascinating um, uh, news. The 2021 October term, so the last term that started, that began last year, October, and last at the end of June, was a historic term, an exceptional term in the history of the court for several reason, uh, reasons. Uh, one of them, one of the major reasons was a interpretative shift in how, uh, in, in the controlling method of constitutional interpretation after decades long progressive domination, a new conservative majority coalesced to issue high-profile rulings in cases like gun rights, uh, vaccine mandates, administrative state, environmental protection, school choice, religious liberty, and of course, abortion. I should have said first this one. And the last, the abortion case, you may remember the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization overturned a nearly 50 years old precedent, the 1973 Roe v. Wade precedent, that had been at the center of American constitutional and political debates uh, in the past uh, several decades. On the other hand, as you may also know, um, a unprecedented leak occurred. Um, after a draft opinion of this abortion decision uh, came to light uh, before its finalization. And as a result of this leak, a massive protest uh, broke out, both in Washington and other parts of the countries as a country as well. Uh, an eight foot tall security barrier was also erected for security reason around the Supreme Court, which is, I think, also unprecedented, and Justice Alito, Samuel Alito, one of the uh, justices, and his family were placed under police protection uh, because of threats. Also, there was an attempted murder of Justice Brett Kavanaugh, another uh, member of the Supreme Court. So the last, last term really seemed like a American thriller movie. But put together all of this, uh, I think this is 
a signal that something is not quite right with the American court system, with American democracy, with American constitutional system. And first of all, my, my observation is that there is, there is an enormous take of the Supreme Court decisions and, and its impact on, on the American uh, uh, life. And my first question is, how has the federal judiciary become so um, decisive, so powerful, um, when Alexander Hamilton used to say that this is the weakest among the three branches of government, and how healthy is this development, and also uh, why was the abortion debate really elevated to, the, to that prominent level? Sure. Um, well, thanks for that. Kosanum. That's the that's the only word in Hungarian I know. Um, but just to just to be clear, I'm not uh, the stereotypical monolingual American. I speak half a dozen languages. Just none of them are Hungarian or anything close to it. Of course. So I'm glad that all of you uh, speak uh, so good English. Um, delighted to be here. It's been more than 20 years since I visited Budapest. It's a little different now. Um, but uh, delighted to talk about this, this area that I've been studying. Um, the first Monday is the, the historic uh, you know, first day of the new term. And uh, this year we have a new justice, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, and actually before I came here, when I was in my hotel, I was listening to the first part of the first argument uh, of the term, which we can talk about later. It's an important property rights case. So to understand the judicial wars or the nature of the toxic debate that we have over uh, the Supreme Court and the role of the judiciary, you have to understand, um, well, that this goes back decades. So it's taken a long time for the court to become as powerful and important as it is now. Every June at the end of the term, well, technically the term runs until through September, but they go on vacation after June. Uh, every June, the Supreme Court decides half a dozen of the most important political controversies in the country. Um, that didn't always, that wasn't always the case. And uh, as uh, it came to be over decades, that power centralized in Washington, in the federal government. And within the federal government, there is a skewing of power from kind of our balance to uh, more towards the executive branch and the administrative state, the bureaucracy, uh, which cannot be unelected, right? If you don't like what Congress is doing, you can elect someone else. But with a bureaucracy, you uh, have to sue them and America is a very litigious society, so you have a lot of lawsuits that then ultimately end up at the Supreme Court uh, because it's those agencies that are deciding things like vaccine mandates or environmental regulation, um, these sorts of, of things. And so the court's very powerful. So every time there's a vacancy, that's a big deal politically. The second part of this dynamic is that over decades again, again, not an overnight thing, you've had uh, a divergence of uh, interpretive theories, how to interpret the Constitution, how to interpret statutes, that now these theories map onto partisan preference at a time when the parties are more uh, ideologically sorted and polarized than they've been since at least the Civil War. So, there's not any overlap. There's not any way to reconcile these visions. And so every time there's a vacancy in this one of nine very powerful seats, it's a big political uh, battle, uh, especially when that seat potentially represents a big shift in jurisprudence, as when the conservative Kavanaugh replaced the moderate or centrist swing vote Kennedy or when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was on the left when she died and was replaced by 
the conservative Amy Coney Barrett. These are significant uh, moments. And so that's why we have this uh, big debate uh, over the court. Uh, and in general right now is a time of low institutional trust in America. You know, those on the left don't like certain things. They question the legitimacy of some of the nominations of the current justices. They question the electoral college, the way that the president is elected. They question the Senate, lots of institutional problems. On the right, uh, there's distrust with elections and the legitimacy of the elections. So, you know, the court is now in the middle of all of that. And then when we talk about abortion, I mean, this is an issue that in America, uh, after Roe v. Wade was decided nearly 50 years ago, never went away, and it became the animating issue of the conservative legal movement, of American politics that presidents are asked about on the campaign. Um, and so overturning that case, which has never been accepted, you know, unlike almost any other issue where there's a rapid change, either in acceptance or a change in, in public opinion, abortion is just as controversial now as it was 50 years ago. And for the court to take this decision, uh, it's kind of scrambled the, the politics of the nation as we head into the midterm elections. Thank you for these introductory um, remarks. Currently, there is also increasing talk and discussion about how to reform the Supreme Court, the federal uh, judiciary, uh, including most controversially expanding its size, so increasing the number of justices. Uh, historically, there were times when the number of justices were cha was changed, but it has been fixed, if I'm, I'm correct, since uh, 18, 69. And the last attempt to uh, somehow uh, increase, uh, pack the court, so to speak, was under President Roosevelt in uh, 1937. But that, that attempt spectacularly failed. Uh, however, the Biden ad administration created a commission uh, to, in order to document uh, these debates over, over the, this, the uh, operation and structure of the Supreme Court and a number of justices, and to come up with, with uh, various reform avenues. And now, you, you have also looked into, extensively looked into this question in your book, um, and please talk to us about... I brought an autographed copy for you, by the way. I left it in the hotel, but I'll bring it to you later this week. So. Thank you. And I, I read the e-version uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and uh, I can testify that it's really extensive. Um, so please talk to us about the different kind of reforms, reform proposal, their advantages, disadvantages, shortcomings, and how, how you see the uh, uh, potential reform. Right, so on the campaign trail in the, um, ahead of the 2020 presidential election, uh, all of the Democratic contenders, candidates, uh, endorsed some version of Supreme Court reform except Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, who are the last two standing. Uh, this is possibly the only thing on which I agree with Senator Sanders, uh, when he was asked about court packing, he said, well, no, look, because if we add two justices, then the next time the Republicans have power, they'll add two justices, and in 50 years, we'll have 87 people on the court. It's no good, it's no good, I, I agree. Um, what Biden said was, look, the court is out of whack, and so he'll appoint a commission, which he did. And the commission last December produced a report. I testified before the commission, virtually. It was all done through Zoom, but I, I testified before it. Um, and they produced a report that's even longer than my book, I think. Uh, but it's very good. It's, it, it gives you the history of lots of different things, lots of perspectives. 
Um, you know, after you read my book, if you're really interested in this stuff, you can read their, their report. It doesn't endorse any, any reforms. That, that wasn't its charge. It just details and says advantages, disadvantages, things like this. Uh, the two most common reforms that are talked about are court packing, which is the definition of that is expanding the court for political reasons, uh, and term limits. There are some other things that I can talk about if you like and Q&A, but um, the, the, these two are the most major ones. And you're right, uh, the last time that this was tried by, by President Roosevelt in 1937, it failed spectacularly. In those midterms in 1938, uh, the Democrats lost 80 seats in the House and eight in the Senate uh, because of the court packing proposal, but because FDR had such a huge majority and had just been reelected in a huge landslide, uh, the Democrats still controlled Congress even after that disastrous uh, midterm. Uh, but anyway, uh, what eventually happened was that the Democrats controlled that power, and FDR, after not appointing any justices in the first, I think it was six or seven years of his presidency, would appoint eight of the nine in the next three and a half to four years. So that historically has been the way that you change the court. You hold power, sustain political power, and, and make those appointments. And, and you're right. There's nothing magical about the number nine. It's not in the Constitution. Congress could change it with a simple law. Uh, but it's held that way for over 150 years. And by the way, before it was set at nine, uh, the court started at six. It went down to five. It went up as high as 10. But every change was done in part for political reasons that were controversial and were not always helpful for the country uh, as a whole. So there's a whole history uh, of that that, that, I've, that I've written about. Um, this is now seen still, this court packing idea is still seen as tremendously controversial. And it's not the case that, you know, if only the Democrats had one or two more senators, they would pass court packing. No, I don't think so. I don't think there's even 25 votes to expand the court. What they would do, what they will do if, they, if the Democrats uh, have a successful midterm and add some senators to what's now 50-50, uh, is that they'll likely pass legislation for some of their priorities. They talk about abortion, they talk about voting rights, certain other things that would effectively reverse certain Supreme Court decisions. That they would do. I don't think they would pack the court uh, as a whole. But um, I, I do agree still with Senator Sanders that if the Democrats did attempt to pack the court, that the next time the Republicans uh, took over the White House and the Senate, they would then you know, unpack it or repack it, uh, as the case may be. Now, real quickly, the other big reform term limits, the idea it would be to have an 18-year term limit with a vacancy every two years. So every presidential term would get two. Uh, and then you'd have a certain process, so you, you know, the, the Senate couldn't filibuster so that you would uh, uh, you know, keep that vacancy open for the next president or something like that. There would be a, an automatic mechanism that the nominee would be deemed confirmed. Uh, you can work that out the way that you write this process. Now this would take a constitutional amendment because our Constitution does say that all federal judges, not just Supreme Court, but all federal judges serve during good behavior. So the only way you can get rid of them is if they're impeached, which a few lower court judges have been. No Supreme Court justices have. Um, and uh, uh, opinion surveys show that people would have more confidence in the Supreme Court if you had these term limits, because then you wouldn't have you know, very old justices and these kind of morbid health watches over octogenarian justices. You wouldn't have politically timed retirements and arbitrary vacancies, these sorts of things that detract from popular confidence. So, okay, that's fine. If, if I, would, I would accept any measure to improve comp public confidence in the integrity of the court. But look, it would not change the political battles over the court. And indeed, if you had these term limits, then every presidential election would be even more an election about the court because that presidential term would be guaranteed to have two uh, nominations. Every Senate election, 
Your Senate uh, term is six years. That senator would be voting on three nominations. So let's be clear. That's great. You know, get rid of these arbitrary vacancies or politically timed retirements. Good. That's that would be good. Uh, but uh, if your goal is to depoliticize the court, term limits is not going to uh, achieve that. It's, it achieves other uh, goals. And then other kind of reform proposals, I mean, changing who asks questions, for example. Make it be lawyers in the Senate, not senators who are going to make speeches and grandstand. Have it be lawyers. You know, I don't think the problem is with the nature of the hearings. The hearings are kabuki theater. They're beside the point. Every political actor, including the nominee, is acting based on their incentives, right? The incentive of the nominee is to talk a lot without saying very much. The incentive of the party of the president is to make the nominee look smart and nice. And the incentive of the opposing party is to throw gotcha questions and, you know, a thing. It's, it's all theater. The, the hearings themselves, the public process is almost irrelevant. Uh, uh, at this point. Well, what about, you know, there's a proposal to expand the court to 15, uh, but make five Republican appointed, five Democratic appointed, five uh, that have to be agreed upon by the first 10. I mean, clever, obviously uh, conceived of by professors because it's too clever. If you're trying to depoliticize the court, how do you do that if two-thirds of its members at this point would have a partisan label attached to their name, right? You know, too clever by half. Now, again, uh, I, I never fully joined the Georgetown uh, faculty, wasn't given the keys to the faculty lounge, so maybe there are some secrets there that I'm not fully understanding, but there are some academic proposals like this, uh, cycling through lower court judges rather than having permanent justices. That would just further politicize the lower courts. I mean, all these other things, but you know, court packing, bad idea, term limits, okay, but wouldn't solve the problem that most people propose it for. Uh, in general, the real issues we're facing are not ones of process or confirmation process or something. They're one of product. Again, the reason we have such politically fraught battles and why the court is a, uh, 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 you know, uh, this, this center of uh, of toxic debate is because it's powerful, and as I said, you have divergent interpretive theories mapping onto partisan preference. Thank you so much for this exhaustive um, explanation and insights. And as we mentioned, um, President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, attempted to pack the court, attempted to increase the number of justices, but he, he failed. But nevertheless, he managed to somehow change the juris jurisprudential direction of the court, the case law of the court, the, the interpretative, the dominant interpretative uh, uh, method the court is, is using. We have a, um, um, a very uh, a famous saying from that era, uh, the switch in time that saved the nine, that somehow refers to the, to the um, a shift in the courts, how the court uh, uh, views uh, 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 the cases. And it's true that politics has always played a role in, in judicial selection since the very beginning of, of American history. We can think about the, well, the, um, right at the beginning, the, the, the famous midnight justices, when, when President John Adams and uh, Chief Justice John Marshall and President Thomas Jefferson had very serious arguments about the role of the court, about how the governmental arrangement should look like in America. And, 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 and this, this um, this debate was hashed out by judicial politics and by a, fa a very famous case, that maybe the, the most famous case to us, the, the Marbury v. Madison uh, a case that, that established um, a judicial review, one of the biggest innovations in Western legal culture. But now, if, you, if, you, we, look, if we look back to the... Um, from 
the era of 1980s in the past decades, uh, thinks polit the, the relation of politics and, 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 and nominees uh, have gotten more heated. Um, how do you see this phenomenon and how have, you mentioned judicial philosophies become an integral part of, of the political battles uh, over judges and, and politics in general uh, in America? Yeah, it's, it's no overstatement to say that um, politics has always been part of the process. George Washington, the very first president, of course, had a Supreme Court nominee rejected for political reasons. So this, is not, uh, this did not start with uh, Robert Bork or with Roe v. Wade or, or something like that. Um, and the Midnight Judges Act, uh, uh, right, uh, as Adams was leaving, uh, as the clock struck midnight on his presidency, he was signing commissions for new judgeships, uh, which led to Marbury versus Madison, which is known for this issue of judicial review, the idea that the Supreme Court, the federal courts, can invalidate uh, the laws of Congress. Now, this to me, and most modern scholars, seems implicit in American constitutional structure. That is, there can be no checks and balances if the judiciary is not empowered to invalidate uh, federal legislation. But it, it didn't say so explicitly. Uh, so that was an important uh, decision. Um, Jefferson, after that, after they resolved that issue, tried to, when he had an opportunity to appoint Supreme Court justices, he was from a different party than Adams and then John Marshall, then the Chief Justice. He was a Democratic Republican, and Marshall and Adams were Federalists. So he tried to appoint justices who would counterbalance the Federalists. But he was not successful. You know, much like Republicans complain in the 1780s uh, and 90s that their nominees, you know, were, were misfires. Uh, similarly, Jefferson's nominees fell under John Marshall's uh, sway. So what's happened in more modern times, let's skip ahead, uh, is precisely, you mentioned judicial philosophy. This is a key moment. Even though politics has played a role in all of our history, it's played a role in different ways. So for example, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, at the turn of the century in the early 1900s, had an innovation that he would consider uh, judges real politics. Not with, whether they were nominally a Democrat or a Republican, but are they progressive? He was a progressive, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, other presidents similarly looked at politics in, in different ways. What changed in about 1968, very important year, culturally in America, politically, but also in terms of judging and judicial politics. Um, uh, LBJ, President Johnson, who was unpopular due to Vietnam and, and other things, uh, his nominee to be Chief Justice was filibustered, was blocked by a bipartisan coalition of senators. And so Nixon, who won that election and campaigned against the Supreme Court, against Earl Warren, for strict constructionism, what was eventually became originalism, uh, he won that election in part on that basis, and uh, he started nominating people based on judicial philosophy, which was an innovation uh, at the time. Uh, and he had a couple of people rejected, so there were, the judicial wars were really hot already in the, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it came to Robert Bork, his nomination in, in 87, that you know, the confirmation hearings became uh, so heated. And that was in part because the Bork hearings were the first ones that were fully televised. Uh, that was the year that C-SPAN, our channel that uh, published, uh, 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 broadcast public affairs, so uh, the Senate, the House, important other things. Sometimes they, you know, I've spoken at events that they would broadcast. Something like this might make C-SPAN. Uh, but they, for the first time, got a license to broadcast all of the Senate proceedings, including confirmation hearings. And, and Bork did not um, uh, comply with this, well, the, 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 the playbook was not yet established that nominees are supposed to talk a lot without saying very much. 
He turned it into an academic seminar and tried to score debaters' points rather than gaining votes from the Senate. He arguably lost votes during his, his confirmation hearing. Uh, and that sort of inaugurated the modern age of, of uh, how both parties treat these hearings um, and, uh, and what we think of now as these, uh, the controversies with, uh, with the nominations over judicial philosophy. Uh, you mentioned Robert Bork. He's one of the fathers of originalism and the originalist view and the originalist method of constitutional interpretation. And what we witnessed in the past years, and especially in the 2021 October term, uh, was a watershed in the life of the Supreme Court and maybe uh, in the federal judiciary as after decades long progressive domination, uh, the originalist approach uh, and the originalist uh, method of, of interpreting constitution has become controlling. Um, let's take a step back and my question is, uh, what are the rival uh, interpretative um, method? What's their essence? And what is the stake of this, this game and the stake of this uh, paradigm shift uh, we are witnessing uh, at the court? And I'm also wondering, because we, we mentioned a lot of uh, defects um, surrounding the, the uh, concerning the, the Supreme Court, a lot of shortcomings. I'm wondering whether this originalism and originalist view can offer remedy uh, to, these, to these shortcomings and, and to the people's complaints about the distortion of American uh, 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 democracy. So originalism is not some complicated thing. Um, or some mysterious force. Um, originalism just says, interpret constitutional provisions based on what their public meaning was at the time they were enacted, okay? What the public meaning was at the time they were enacted. So it's not about the framer's intent. You don't have to ask the question, what does James Madison think about violent video games? Right? You don't have to ask about uh, what does Abraham Lincoln think about uh, the internet, right? That, no. You look at the words on the page and you think about what does it mean the right to keep and bear arms? Unreasonable search and seizure. By looking at dictionaries, newspaper articles, you might have heard of the Federalist Papers. Those were a series of essays that explained to the American people, or actually to the people of New York, they were published first in New York newspapers, to convince the New York legislature to ratify um, the Constitution. Uh, the 14th Amendment, which is very important, uh, that's the, the Dobbs abortion decision, many other decisions about individual rights, are decided under the 14th Amendment, which was passed after the Civil War to provide protections against state violations of individual rights. And it has three important clauses about due process, equal protection, and privileges or immunities. So what do those words, what do those phrases mean in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified? Those are the questions that originalists ask. And it's not an easy thing. You don't just plug it into a computer. These are debated historical things, and that's fine, but that's the hard work of, of originalism. So to be clear, again, it's not um, what did someone intend a provision to mean. It's not what did they understand it to mean. It's what did the words on the page mean. Okay. Um, competing theories are... Well, first of all, one that gets talked about a lot, although none of the 
justices on the left explicitly say that this is what they do, but it's called living constitutionalism, which means the Constitution evolves, it's a living document, it evolves over time. This is the dominant theory in Canada, for example. They call it a, a living tree, right, which has branches that grow and turn and have other branches. Um, it's kind of like common law constitutionalism in the Anglo-Saxon system in the law. Uh, we base you know, what the law is based on judicial opinions that grow and build on each other. They respect precedent, but they take into account new developments. Um, there are other theories of uh, Justice Breyer, who just retired. He had a theory of active liberty. You, you interpret uh, provisions in a way that enhances liberty. Um, so there's different things, uh, theories uh, like that. Um, originalism doesn't have to be conservative. You know, it depends which provision you're interpreting. In fact, there's now a challenge to originalism from the right called common good conservatism, which says that instead judges should look to what the common good is under a conception of natural law. Um, you know, anyway, but that's, you know, those are the, the ways that, that judges look at the law. And, and you see that the Republican appointed justices who are supposed to be conservative, they have differences as well among themselves. Uh, Thomas is a very pure originalist. Uh, Kavanaugh looks at more text and history and he's more cautious. Uh, uh, Gorsuch, Neil Gorsuch is more libertarian or natural rights based. Um, Amy Coney Barrett is very much like Scalia in various ways, not quite like Thomas in all respects. Uh, Alito is kind of law and order, and yes, he likes history, but not originalist necessarily. John Roberts is perhaps more like Bork in terms of uh, really caring about judicial restraint and minimalism, stepping with small steps rather than making big decisions, even if they're not quite right. So a lot of variety in kind of the text, history, and structure-based theories uh, on the right. Um, but that's uh, sort of where the, the, the fervent uh, uh, is. And what we saw in this last term is that um, having a, a, a cushion matters. That is, for so long, we'd been used to having sort of four on the right, four on the left, and a swing justice. Well, now, there's not really a swing justice, and John Roberts, this cautious uh, incrementalist is the sixth vote. The median justice is Kavanaugh, and he's definitely uh, on the right uh, somewhat. So we'll see where that goes. If the court is willing to overturn Roe v. Wade, this big controversial case, then presumably it's willing to do other bold things uh, if it thinks that uh, you know old decisions are bad or, or, or things like that. And how do you think can originalism um, offer remedies to the structural shortcoming of the Supreme Court? Well, I don't think there are any structural shortcomings. I mean, this is, there's a debate over the court's legitimacy now. It's very much a debate among elites. The man on the street, you know, who thankfully doesn't spend his time, you know, reading the report of the Supreme Court Commission or, you know, reading these uh, cases uh, in depth, uh, looks at a decision and says, I like that, I don't like that. Okay, it's not about the structure of the court so much as, um, you know, is it uh, so out of the mainstream that the court uh, becomes, uh, you know, not accepted in some way. And this is what you're getting at with the switch in, in time that saved nine. Uh, the court, uh, sometimes this myth, uh, people think that the, the court started shifting how it ruled on the New Deal programs under Roosevelt because of his court packing threat. No. It started to change because it saw the popular momentum and the popularity of the democratic program, and so it stopped invalidating uh, or enforcing the federal, federal limits, uh, the, the constitutional limits on federal power. And by the way, I think ultimately that hurt us because the Constitution was amended 
implicitly. And so we stopped debating whether something was constitutional and, and simply assumed that whatever Congress was doing uh, was constitutional. It wouldn't be until 1995 uh, that the court would invalidate a, an act of Congress for going beyond uh, federal power. So I think originalism eventually, in the long term, uh, certainly has uh, the potential of educating people, uh, showing that you know this is what the Constitution says. If you don't like it, amend the Constitution or you know make different decisions in different states. Um, because that's ultimately what we're having with abortion now. You know, New York and California don't have to have the same rule as Texas and Oklahoma. That's perfectly fine. And that's the same for family law or tort law or criminal law. I think that has, that kind of federalism has the potential of diffusing some of these battles um, uh, at the federal level. You also mentioned um, a new emerging view or interpretation, uh, which is called common good constitutionalism. And I'm just wondering what's your view and opinion, whether this common good constitutionalism has a strong enough base and uh, ideologic rigor uh, to become a rival of originalism in the, in the near future? I think had Dobbs, the abortion case, or Bruin, the uh, Second Amendment gun case, uh, gone the other way last term, then common good constitutionalism really would be uh, on the rise. Because the argument would be, well, look, we, among conservatives, look, you know, establishment conservative legal movement, we've tried this originalism, we've tried this textualism, and it's not working. We need to match the left at their own game. We need a result-oriented conception of justice, of the common good. But that didn't happen. We got the results that we did. And so now, common good constitutionalism, I think, will remain uh, a marginal academic idea. Um, I don't think, you know, the, you know, maybe certain parts of natural law theory might come into certain aspects of things, uh, but I think the conservative legal movement uh, will, not, uh, uh, will not need to and, and will not in practice need to change um, uh, in light of this new theory. Thank you. Before I, 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 I ask the last question, I would uh, now turn to the audience. Um, and the students who are with us. Uh, uh, now, I was told that uh, it's not your custom or your culture to ask questions, but please, come on. Uh, I'm, you know, this, this, is, this is your chance. I'm really happy to talk about things that, uh, you know, for me might be basic or, you know, that I just assume, but that you've always wanted to know about the American uh, Constitution or the judicial system or something like that. Thank you very much for this discussion. My question will be, how do you think you can depoliticize the court? Yeah, very simple question, yes. Um, look, there are no easy or uh, quick solutions, right? All of these proposed reforms, I don't think they, 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 they would ultimately do anything. They're, they're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. They're addressing symptoms. The real root of the problem is that over decades, uh, the court has allowed a warping of our federalism and of our separation of powers. You know, the ultimate way to depoliticize the court is to force Congress to make political decisions rather than, for example, pass broad laws, the Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Act of 2022, and then have the uh, departments of you know, health and human services flesh that out. And then when somebody complains, the congressman says, no, 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 I voted for truth, beauty, and goodness. You have to go sue that deputy undersecretary of health, uh, you know, who misinterpreted what I wanted. And then ultimately the Supreme Court has to, has to decide that. Um, or, uh, you know, putting in, allowing the court has one size fits all solutions for such a large pluralistic 
diverse society. You know, there's no reason that there has to be the same type of healthcare system uh, uh, in every state than that zoning rules be the same in every city. So, you know, let Texas be Texas and California be California. That's how you diffuse tensions, uh, again, at the political stage as well as in the marble palace of the highest court of the land. But again, that's not an easy, uh, uh, an easy fix. Uh, until then, um, you know, we have such, again, divergent views that are delineated by party. Um, an interesting moment will happen uh, when the next time that we have a confirmation process during a time of divided government, when the presidency and the Senate are controlled by opposite parties, we haven't had one of those since 1991, which was Clarence Thomas, which obviously was a big, uh, a big fight. But will there have to be some sort of compromise pick? Um, President Obama in 2016 thought he was giving a compromise pick, uh, but the Republicans said we simply won't. Uh, uh, they took a political position, which is fully constitutional, but controversial politically. We simply won't take up the nomination. That's our, that's our advice. But let's say Scalia had died, or the next justice uh, during a time of divided government uh, goes in the second or third year of the presidency. You can't have that seat open for that long. So what will the process look like then? That will, that will be an interesting indicator. Thank you very much for this discussion. Uh, I would have two questions. The first one is, um, would you say that the electoral college is still the best electoral system for the US? And if there was any other that you would prefer, which one would it be? And the second one is related to the Second Amendment rights. Why do you think, if you think, it's still relevant and necessary for the US to exist? Um, so the Electoral College, each state uh, gets a number of electors, that is the number of House representatives plus two, plus the two senators. That's, each state has that many Electoral College uh, members. And um, each state sets the rules for itself how to allocate those electoral votes for president. So you, you know, we think that, well, whoever wins the state wins all of its votes. Not true. In fact, uh, Nebraska and Maine do it a different way. They allocate them by, I think the winner gets two, and then the rest are allocated by congressional districts. So sometimes you'll see one or two electoral votes that are different uh, in Maine and Nebraska. But states could do it in different ways. They could say the, w the winner gets, you know, five and the loser gets three. They could, they could allocate them how they want, but most states do it winner takes all. Uh, the purpose of this system is to prevent uh, a president being elected with super majorities only in one region. Uh, or now it would be only among, you know, the 10 biggest cities or something like that. Um, so that's, you know, I like that system in the sense that it, it prevents regional candidates from, from, from from winning. If we got rid of it, if it was purely based on national popular vote, then instead of having, you know, eight swing states, you would have eight swing cities. Because, you know, think about what the, you know, most democratic city in the countries are, right? New York, LA, big cities, lots of Democrats. Well, you know what? There are more Republicans in New York and LA than there are in most cities as well, just because there's there are huge cities. So all the campaigns would be only uh, in the big cities. And it would be easier to commit voter fraud. If all you care about is the total national vote, well then go into some district that's completely controlled by Democrats and stuff the ballot. If the, you know, or, or that are completely controlled by Republicans and stuff the ballot, because it's only the national vote that's important. So, so yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly the electoral college, but some system that ensures, you know, uh, national uh, pluralities, I think, is better than just a one national popular vote. Uh, as far as uh, the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, I think, is important um, because we have a tradition of preserving the, the natural right to, to self-defense. And uh, even more in the post-Civil War era, I mentioned the 14th Amendment, um, you know, at the time of the founding, the concern was 
tyranny. We just got rid of King George. We don't want our new government, governments, state and federal, uh, to be tyrannous, tyrannical, so we'll have, make sure all able-bodied men at least uh, 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 access firearms. After the Civil War, it was disarmament of uh, political minorities. So either freed slaves or Confederate sympathizers in the North, Union sympathizers in the South, Chinese railroad workers in the West, so politically unpopular minorities who otherwise were being oppressed economically in other ways, the thought was we need to give them a way to defend themselves. And I think the right to armed self-defense is, um, uh, is still very important and relevant. Thank you. My question would be, I'm actively following the case where the Supreme Court uh, interviews these huge uh, social media companies, not just social media, when they uh, interview Facebook, Amazon, the CEO of Facebook, Amazon, and Google at the same time. And I'm curious why uh, these companies always win these arguments. Why are they capable of this? Well, the Supreme Court doesn't interview anybody. They have hearings with, where lawyers uh, argue you know, on opposite sides of a particular case. You might be thinking of uh, congressional hearings where the CEOs of the, the tech companies appear and answer questions from senators or, or representatives. Um, uh, I don't know if you have a particular political issue in mind with regard to the tech companies. Uh, you know, they're, they're occasionally involved in Supreme Court arguments. There is a, a big issue that's going to come to the Supreme Court, maybe even this term, it hasn't been taken up yet, but it could still be towards the end of the term because there is a split among the lower courts uh, on new social media laws that have been passed by Florida and Texas, respectively, that regulate these uh, companies as if they were common carriers, kind of like railroads 150 years ago, uh, because they're, uh, you know, in effect monopolies, in effect they had their network effects for antitrust purposes that you can't just build another railroad if you, you know, don't like what this one is doing. You can't build another Google, things like that. Uh, and the appell federal appellate court invalidated Florida's largely, but largely upheld Texas's. So there's a conflict in legal analysis there. And uh, interestingly, both of the opinions by the 11th Circuit in Florida and the 5th Circuit in Texas uh, were written by judges appointed by Donald Trump. So this is, you know, judges who I respect very much and generally agree with both of them. So I have to think about, what, you know, who's right in this issue. But that sort of case, I think, is going to come. Uh, and it's unclear which way the uh, Supreme Court is going to side. But I, I don't think it's, it's, it's fair to say at all that the, you know, uh, the, 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 the new tech companies uh, always win in their, in their um, court cases. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to know how the upcoming midterm um, election influences the decisions and the judgment of, of the Supreme Court. Well, I don't think they decide cases based on the latest polls. Um, you know, oh, uh, our, our, our confidence level is this, that way we can overturn Roe v. Wade, or it's not quite high enough, or uh, they're not looking at that in particular. Historically, uh, the court doesn't get too far ahead or behind public opinion, um, but there are uh, occasionally, of course, unpopular decisions. Uh, when Obergefell, the same-sex marriage case, was decided, the court's level of unpopularity dropped to about the same, uh, maybe a couple of points higher than it is now after the abortion decision. Obviously, be then it was conservatives who were unhappy, now it's progressives who are unhappy, but um, there are you know, readings like that. I don't think um, the court uh, tracks things uh, that closely that way. Um, you know, it's... You know, they, they don't live in a vacuum. Uh, they're, they're, they're real people. Um, I think some justices care more about general 
sustained political views more than others. Um, from a political science perspective, my opinion is that the judges and justices in general act least legitimately when they take into account things like legitimacy, you know, things that are not simply what is your view of the law and apply the law. Um, these midterms, I don't know how they'll go. Uh, you know, Republicans will almost certainly win the House. What will happen in the Senate? I don't know. It's a toss-up. There, there are some swing seats where Republicans have weak candidates. So if they lose, everyone's going to try to explain it by, you know, different factors. I don't know how much of an impact the Supreme Court really uh, will have in people's decision-making when there's also considerations of inflation and the battle over wokeness and school choice and all of these other things that are going on. And, of course, traditionally, midterm elections are a referendum on the incumbent president who, you know, Biden's popularity is a couple of points higher than it was six months ago, but it's still under 50 percent. If there is no hands, um, oh, there's one, one other, yeah. Hi, uh, uh, thank you for the wonderful discussion. So my question is related to uh, the free speech, and I wanted to know your opinion on uh, reasonable restrictions, the First Amendment and the reasonable restrictions. Uh, to a country like the United States, does a uh, court ever think about having reasonable restrictions in freedom of, uh, in, in speech? Uh, well, the standard is not uh, whether a restriction is reasonable. The standard is effectively, um, uh, does the government have, because free speech is a funda considered to be a fundamental right, and so the court asks whether there is a you know, compelling reason to, um, to have the rule and whether it's drawn as narrowly as possible to achieve that very compelling goal. No right is absolute, not, not Second Amendment, not First Amendment. And so, for example, what is the most highest value of protected speech under the U.S. Constitution? Political speech, political speech. And yet, I cannot go to your neighborhood in the middle of the night and at, at 2 a.m. yell through a bullhorn my opinion of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Why? Because you can have time, place, and manner restrictions. Uh, if I want to have a big parade on some political issue, whether it's controversial or not, I need a permit from the city to have that parade. Okay, that's a bit of a burden. You know, I can't just go have the parade. And yet that's okay because it's a time, place, and manner restriction. So, you know, there are certain kinds of restrictions or regulations that are okay, uh, but certainly America is possibly the most speech protective uh, country in the world, uh, and we, we generally like that. There's obviously now a debate about you know, hate speech and things like that, but there are very few exceptions for speech that's not protected, and it would be something like uh, a direct incitement of violence or child pornography or um, uh, fraud, right? If I speak that, you know, I'll sell you this gold for $100 and it turns out it's worthless rock, that speech is not protected because that's, that's you know, spoken fraud. So there's very narrow exceptions to, to speech protection. You know, whether you think that other kinds of restrictions would be, quote unquote, reasonable, but Americans are distrustful of government authorities for making decisions on what's reasonable or not. If there's no more hands, uh, our students are not only speaking, but they are also writing, and I have a technical assistance. Uh, so I have questions, written questions, and I, I just chose one because it seems very, very interesting and simple. What are the reasons that the US Constitution got preserved its shape? Is it good or bad? I think. What is the secret of the success, or is it a success, or it's not a success? That uh, it's, an, it's a very old, one of the oldest uh, written constitution uh, around the world. Yeah. Well, it was revolutionary in its day. 
Um, it was the embodiment of Enlightenment era values and you know the latest political theory at the time, uh, and that's proved largely workable. There were crises, certainly. The Civil War, slavery, could not be resolved by the framing because there were slave states that were joining the Union. So that was left unresolved. There were various compromises in the original Constitution, but everyone knew that eventually that would have to be faced, and uh, it could not be faced without bloodshed. So, you know, the nation, we still have the same Constitution, but people refer to the post-Civil War amendments. There were three amendments. I mentioned the 14th Amendment to protect, uh, including under federal law in federal courts against state violation of individual rights. Then the 13th Amendment, uh, eliminating slavery. And then the 15th Amendment, guaranteeing the, the right to vote regardless of race. Uh, people call that era the second founding because that was a fundamental transformation of the relationship of the citizen to the state, the states to the federal government. Uh, you know, that was different. So in some countries, a civil war would prompt a new constitution. Our constitution survived but had a very significant change. And then uh, during the industrial era, uh, when a lot of countries had revolutions or you know, communist, socialist uh, influences that created a new constitution, um, eventually that progressive era was incorporated legislatively and eventually constitutionally in part uh, as well. So the amendment process and the political process prevented a throwing out of the Constitution then. And of course, unlike Europe, we didn't have world wars fought uh, on, our, on our land, and so we didn't have to you know, reconstitute the, the, the government uh, in that way. Um, so you know, political scientists, constitutional theorists talk about, well, America actually has had several new constitutions, and you know, the way that we interpret the Constitution now is very different than we interpreted the same words on the page uh, you know, 100 years ago or something. There's, there's something to that. Um, but I think, uh, I think we're fortunate to have that, that lasting uh, document uh, in the, not necessarily the same shape. As I said, there have been amendments, uh, but to have that uh, allegiance to those ideas and, and America being based on civic ideas rather than uh, blood and soil has been a, a healthy thing for our country. And my last question is, well, today, tonight, is the first Monday in October. So we are seeing now the beginning of a new term, the 2022 October term at the Supreme Court. And my question is, what can we expect from that term? And what are the big cases, the so-called blockbusters, that we should really pay attention to? Well, before coming here, I was listening to a case called Sackett versus Environmental Protection uh, Agency. I, I've actually filed briefs in that case. I filed briefs 10 years ago when it came to the court on a previous preliminary uh, procedural issue. Uh, it asked the question of how you define federal jurisdiction and therefore the power to restrict development of certain property when there is arguably wetlands that are near navigable water. So under federal law, under the understanding that Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce, um, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, regulates navigable waters. Well, there's a piece of property that's sort of near something that might or might not be a wetland, which itself is near a navigable water. Uh, and this couple that have been trying to build this uh, house for themselves in Idaho uh, has been prevented from, from doing so. It's a hugely important for federal versus state regulation and uh, uh, regulatory authority under the Clean Water Act. Affirmative action, the, uh, the ability to, for, for universities to consider race in making admissions decisions. Um, this is a case challenging the procedures in Harvard and the University of North Carolina which happened to be the oldest private and public universities, respectively. Uh, and for you know, 43 years now, uh, the court has allowed the use of race to advance educational diversity. And 
it's been complicated, and it seems like at both Harvard and UNC, race is used as a dispositive factor rather than one of many, uh, and it's very controversial. In fact, you know, abortion is kind of a 50-50 issue in America. Affirmative action or racial preferences is more like 66%, 70% against it. So the court, if it rules, as many people expect, against the use of race, that would be, first of all, a popular decision, but secondly, there would be massive resistance by the educational institution. So it would be very messy, but that's the, probably the biggest case of the term. Another big controversial case involves a graphic designer who does not want to make a website for a same-sex uh, wedding. And you might recall a case from several years ago where it was a, a baker who didn't want to make a cake for a same-sex wedding. Well, here, very similar issues, except you don't have to debate whether cake baking is expressive and protected by the First Amendment. Here, there's no question that making a website is First Amendment activity, so it's protected, but how does that mesh with anti-discrimination law? Uh, and here, the issue is it's not freedom of religion. It's, it's speech, and it's can the state compel you to speak in a certain way. Uh, almost certainly, the graphic designer here will win because it's not the situation where, um, you know, if, you, if, if this designer doesn't, doesn't make it, then the couple is out of luck. You know, there are many, many uh, businesses that are, uh, can, can, can provide the same service, and so there's no need, I think, will be the court's uh, rationale for compelling this kind of, of speech. Election law. There's a provision in the Constitution that says state legislatures shall uh, 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 devise the manner of holding elections and regulating them. Uh, well, what happens when state courts, state courts, uh, interpret that state law in such a way that some argue is completely rewriting it? Does that violate that principle of what's called the independent state legislature doctrine? The question really is, what is the federal remedy for this? Because state courts do and should interpret state law all the time on state criminal law, tort law, family law, right? We don't have the, you know, the, the US Supreme Court coming in and overruling state Supreme Courts when they try to interpret a contract under state law. So what is the standard for saying, well, this is just interpretation, but here's the line, this becomes rewriting. I don't know if they are gonna be able to do that. Maybe they could say, we don't know what the line is, but here, the North Carolina Supreme Court really did go you know, very far. The problem is, this, the North Carolina constitutional provision that they were interpreting is itself very vague and broad. So open to wide interpretation. So I don't know, but that's gonna be very important for the regulation of elections. Not the midterms, this won't be decided until next spring, but certainly the 2024 uh, presidential. Another case that seems very technical, but is significant for governance and jurisprudence going forward. Uh, California, you know, is a big state, has a lot of regulations, they're very intrusive economically, and uh, oftentimes they set a standard for, for the nation because a car company, for example, is not gonna make one set of, um, design a muffler or an exhaust system in one way for the rest of the country and another way to meet California emissions rules. Well, here we have a case of uh, agricultural regulation where California says for uh, pigs, they had to be uh, lawful, the pork products, they have to be raised in a certain amount of space, okay? Now, only 0.2% of the pork industry, of the, of the uh, pigs that are raised for slaughter to make pork, are raised in California. So this is definitionally a regulation extraterritorially of other states. And California says it's going to send its agriculture agents to Arkansas and Michigan and Illinois to, to, to see whether they're complying with the law. Does that kind of regulation by one state uh, uh, to regulate interstate commerce trump Congress's authority over interstate commerce or uh, in other way violate interstate relations? 
very interesting, can be technical, uh, but will have significant ramifications for laws that states pass in lots of areas that have impacts beyond state lines. So that, uh, those, uh, uh, I think, are the, the top half dozen or so cases uh, to look for. And uh, you can actually, through the wonders of technology, you can now actually listen to the Supreme Court arguments. Uh, it's amazing. This is an innovation from the pandemic. It used to be you had to go physically and it was hard to get into the court, especially if you're not admitted to the Supreme Court bar. Uh, like for me, it's just fun theater as a Supreme Court bar member. I go and I watch, but now you don't even have to go there. You can just, in your pajamas, just plug it in and, and listen to the live audio and it's, it's very, it can be very entertaining. So you have a lot to watch and a lot to listen to in the upcoming nine month or so. Uh, the 2022 October uh, uh, term. I thank you so much for Ilya, uh, for your instructive insights on what's behind the world's most powerful court. And may I just have one uh, remark? It, it may seem to be very distant um, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, but uh, what is happening there, it's not irrelevant because um, through judicial dialogue, uh, their decisions, uh, the US Supreme Court decisions, uh, as a ripple effect, can filter in uh, the European court system, both the European international court system, like Strasbourg or Luxembourg, and to the European uh, uh, constitutional court. So we have, um, it's important for us to understand uh, what's going on there, what are the, the defining interpretative methods, and uh, I thank you so much for, uh, for highlighting it in a very instructive way. And it is maybe the end of this conversation, but it's not the end of the conversations with Ilya. Uh, we will continue our constitutional tour around Hungary. On Wednesday at noon, we are going to talk about contemporary constitutional questions in a bigger panel at the University of Public Service. On Friday, we will go to Zalaegerszeg to discuss the concept of American and European ways of life and the need uh, for their uh, protection. And last but not least, on Saturday, uh, we will go to the Law School Academy uh, in Gardoň, where we will discuss uh, whether the democracy in America, as one's talk will saw, uh, transformed to a kind of bureaucracy uh, in America. If you can, please join uh, the other events as well. And uh, right now, please join me in thanking uh, Ilya uh, for this great and truly instructive conversation.